Hi, it's Mark Karjula from Modern Pain Care, and you're listening to the Modern Pain Podcast, and I'm excited again to have David Hanscom, an orthopedic spine surgeon who's joining us for part two. How are you doing today, David? Doing well. I enjoyed a conversation yesterday. It was great. Enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, I'm looking forward to building on that conversation. And one of the things we had discussed the, uh, talking about was the role, in the, fam- the role of the family in some of these persistent pain cases and some of these challenging cases we see come across. I know in physical therapy, we see that quite a bit where it's apparent when you see the dynamics interplaying in the office visits in front of us that there's some situations that aren't maybe moving things in the right direction. But I'm curious, what, what are your th- what's been your experience with the role of the family in your practice? Well, it's maybe the biggest factor. We only discovered this about two years ago. I wrote a book, Back in Control, A Surgeon's Roadmap Out of Chronic Pain. There's a website, backincontrol.com, that's the action plan of the book. The book's just a book. It's a framework that provides a really nice framework for a discussion of of the different issues around pain. Then at the end of the day, the patient actually solves his or her own problem. What we didn't recognize for a long time is that we can do all sorts of different interventions. Patients can take control of their care. But what we didn't realize is that the family triggers are the most powerful triggers. We can do every other treatment in the world. And if you go home and get, well, I'll use the word triggered, um, then, and I define triggering as anytime you're anxious or frustrated, your brain connected to a, the current situation that you're in, either a thought or an action or a person connected with a past event in life that was unpleasant. That's how we survive. We have this whole cache of, prior experiences, some pleasurable, some not so not so pleasurable, but we survive by learning how to avoid danger. So again, as we scan the environment right this second, it's pretty safe. We're both in a room that's quiet, et cetera. We're not running out in front of traffic. But our brain has told us, maybe from a near miss earlier, or our parents telling us not to run in the street, that running out in front of traffic is a problem. So if you're close to speeding cars and become anxious, it means your brain just connected with a learned memory from the past. So anytime you're anxious or upset, you're actually in the past. You're actually not, by definition, in the present. Then there's also saying that neurons that fire together wire together. So the deepest connections we have on this planet are your family. And what's ironic is that your closest connections are your deepest and most powerful triggers. And someone used the word Triggers is a tough word, but trigger just means you just got set off. Your nervous system reacted to something around you. It can be a mild reaction. It can be a quite intense reaction. It can be pure terror or rage. So there's different levels of being triggered. But anytime you're well, – I have a word playing anxiety, by the way, of just alert, nervous, anxious, afraid, um, paranoid, and terrorized. So there's a, real level, there's a real range of being triggered. But unless your families are your deepest triggers because you're so neurologically enmeshed with them. This is 100%. If a couple tells me that they're not triggering each other, I just don't believe them. Because as soon as they get to know them within one or two visits, it's 100%. It just comes out in different forms. Sometimes it's sort of a passive form. Sometimes it's a real aggressive form. But in chronic pain, it's magnified because the people in chronic pain have lots of things going on that really affects the family and vice versa. So what I'd like to focus on today is just the impact of chronic pain on the family, but also the impact of family and chronic pain and this is only on the website. I didn't get this into the book. As I mentioned earlier, I'm writing a third book, basically healing your family from pain. But we found out that the pain, the family is by far and away the strongest factor keeping people in pain. It's also the most powerful pack factor in healing people from pain. Once you understand the basic ground rules, it's not very hard, and the families do it themselves because of family healing effort as opposed to family pain effort. The basic premise is that neurons that fire together, wire together. Any pain, amongst other unpleasant sensation, creates anxiety and frustration. And then your body's programmed to take evasive action, problem solved, anxiety drops. So when other circumstances cause anxiety and frustration, they're simply connected to the pain circuits. So they've done a nice research study shows that when you're triggered or fired up or anxious or frustrated, your pain goes up. And it happens for two reasons. First of all, neurons that fire together wire together. So when anxiety and frustration goes up for any reason, they're simply connected to the pain circuits. But it also changes your body's chemistry. As we mentioned yesterday, when you're anxious or frustrated, it changes your body's chemistry to adrenaline, cortisol, and histamines, 
but it's a survival response because when you're threatened, your body's in high alert, you're sensitized. So now you have an adrenalized nervous system that's on high alert. And then the reason why you're feeling to your deepest triggers is that, I'll just talk about me for a second, but this is, this is universal, is that you have patterns of behavior that are programmed by your mother and your father or both. And what happens is that you have no control over these things. So whether you accept the pattern or reject the pattern, it doesn't matter the patterns are in your brain. So we have this lifetime of programming from our parents first, which are the deepest ones, then our siblings, then our school, then our friends, colleagues, et cetera. So we're programmed by our past, but the deepest programming comes from our parents. That's why I, hear, that's why I keep hearing over and over and over again that those first two years of your life are so critical because if you're nurtured and held and feel safe, the baby's body is full of oxytocin, the love drug, dopamine, the reward drug, serotonin, and the GABA drugs. So not only does a baby feel safe, it's not hypervigilant to, to stimuli around him or her, but also changes the way the nervous system forms. So if you come from a tough, neglectful, abusive background, your initial program is pretty rough. So all of us have patterns to be put in our brain by our father or mother or both. And going forward, when you get married, unfortunately, you get attracted to your darkest patterns because they're the most familiar. So when people end up in long-term relationships, they always end up attracted to the darkest patterns. End of story. They come in different forms. And everybody, everybody that's been married more than 10 years can bear witness to this. Otherwise, they're not really married. They may be either in the same house, not really interacting. But by definition, it's a neurological trick. Couples trigger each other, but it's a neurological trick. Because these family patterns that are programmed into you, programmed into you by your family are not playing out in your family. Then you're passing them on to your kids. So, the, so let's see, you're the person, let, let me talk about two different parts of this discussion. One of them is, what is the impact of your pain on your family? Because it does go both ways. There's a process called mirror neurons that if you smile at a baby, the baby smiles back. It's not because the baby's happy, it's just that you simply trigger that area in the baby's brain. They've done studies with football, with football fans watching a quarterback throw the ball, and the throwing center of the brain lights up. It's how we learn. We imitate them. And we don't know exactly what these neurons look like. There's a lot of debate. Do they exist or do they not exist? Regardless of that, there's a mirror neuron effect where your brain is programming what you're seeing, watching, or hearing. So when you are in a bad mood and you walk in the door of your house, what do you think that does to your family? Right? <clears throat> yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you've noticed this. I mean, unfortunately, I, probably you know, I mean, trust me, I learned this the hard way. It cost me, literally, it cost me marriage, okay? And I didn't really understand until afterwards that um, my, if I knew, I, did, I didn't have the skills. I didn't understand how my mood affected people. So if I walk in the door and I'm in a great mood, what's your household like? Mm -hmm. Pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not psychological. You simply trigger the positive part of your family's brain. If you walk in the front door and you're angry, you've not triggered your entire family to those type of well, two things. First of all, you trigger the part of the brain, which also increase their anxiety. So unfortunately, if you walk in the door, maybe one out of five, one out of 10 times in bad mood, and the other eight or nine times is a good mood, it's even worse because it's intermittent reinforcement, which is a much more positive. In other words, if you walk in the door angry every time, it's actually less damaging than being intermittently angry when you walk in the front door. So then your family now becomes, then your family is now upset and they trigger you back. You get this cosmic ping pong game going because again, neurons that fire together, wire together. So instead of coming home and feeling safe, you now are being triggered back and forth and back and forth. So that's a big problem. The second thing is people in chronic pain are trapped and they're angry. And when you're angry, by definition, you've lost awareness. In other words, the essence of any healthy relationship is becoming aware of other people's needs. So very few people want to abuse their family because they love their family. I ask, I ask my patients all the time, do you love your family or do you like your family? They go, of course. But the family become targets when you're angry. Somehow we feel we have the right, again, I'm saying we, we have the right to take our anger and frustration out on our family. That's the last place you should take out your anger and frustration because you like these people. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, then don't live in the house. But we do it. It's sort of the rule, I think, where you come home, you're frustrated, you take it out of your family. That's the last people that you hear about during your frustrations. But we do it all the time. So in chronic pain, why 
people with chronic pain tend to discuss their pain all the time. They tend to bring it home. My wife, about oh, probably seven years ago now, I'd had big, you know, bad days at work and politics and things weren't going as well as they could. And probably two out of five days, I would bring all my troubles from work home. And this is before I even knew about this. She just said, stop it. And I go, what do you mean? I had a bad day. I'm trying to share my day with you. She goes, stop it. I don't need to hear this stuff. I go, what do you mean? It's part of who I am. But the bottom line is when you come home, you want your place to be a place of comfort, solace, nurturing, and regeneration. Why bring your work troubles into the household? Because again, it triggers her. Even just tone of voice triggers the other person to react in a, in a negative way. The problem though in chronic pain, which is a huge problem, that anger is destructive, including self-destructive. And when you direct anger at anybody, it's destructive. It's also the essence of abuse. So lack of awareness is the essence of abuse. It's not, the, not, it's not like a malicious, malevolent, action is simply when you're angry and frustrated when you're angry and frustrated it's only about you and you just can't see the needs of people around you so not seeing the needs of people in your family and they need you to come, they need to come home and just have fun and relax and watch tv with the tv with them play a game have play catch or whatever but your need is you're really pissed off at the claims examiner or your boss yelled at you comes right into the household so it turns out that all of us trigger each other and and you're, when you're in chronic pain and trapped by pain, you have a legitimate reason to be angry. But the anger is not selective. It just takes on everybody around it. So the whole problem is magnified dramatically in people with chronic pain. So then you're programming those patterns into your kids, which carries right on into the schoolyard. So it's a whole societal issue here as far as your impact of pain on the family. The other thing is that people in chronic pain tend to talk about the pain all the time. I didn't realize this until a few years ago, but probably they probably 60% of the discussions for many people is about pain. Then another 20% of their conscious time is spent looking for a cure or an answer. And I, I get it. I did the same thing for 10 years, but your brain's developing in that direction. Like we talked about yesterday with neuroplasticity, you can't control your anger, frustration or your pain. But if you focus on it, that's part that's going to develop. So you got to get direct your attention a different direction. So the antithesis of anger is play. And when you bring that attitude into the household, you're not triggered a positive reaction that triggers you back and you start, you're starting to switch off the pain circuits. But what happens is that people in the family, when you're complaining about your pain all the time, just wears them out. I mean, that, that wasn't part of the deal when you got married and had a family. It's not what your kids want when they come home from school. They don't want to see their parent in the corner sitting in a chair or even if they're not, even if they're relatively functional and working, but still in pain and complaining a lot. That's not an atmosphere that your people around you want to be in. What happens though, people in chronic pain tend to hang around other people in chronic pain. So it feels normal to complain and talk. One of the negative prognostic factors for chronic pain, by the way, is belong, belonging to a chronic pain support group because, it, because you end up talking about the pain. Now, if you, belong to a support group that doesn't allow you to talk about your pain, which we do in our workshops. By the way, I'm doing a workshop in New York this year at Omega, June 7th through 9th. And one of our basic ground rules, never discuss your pain. We're going to talk more about the solutions tomorrow. Today, I just want to focus on the impact of, of pain on the family. So in summary, the impact that the patient has the family is that they're angry and frustrated with mere neurons and not stimulating that part of the family. They often are angry, which means they lose awareness, and not on purpose, but inadvertently, it's abusive. And so then those, the family triggers you back, and then you discuss the pain. So the impact on the chronic pain on a family is typically profound. It goes the other way around. Well, again, let's go back to the trigger part of it, which is still the essence of this whole thing. So the triggers are put, put, in, put into your brain. The main trigger that happens is with your spouse. Because remember, you get attracted to those patterns in the first place. But the other part that's really disturbing, and I just saw this a few years ago, is that he, my son just has two young, two little babies, beautiful, and everybody has a baby would do anything for these kids, right? But all of a sudden, 8, 10, 12 years old, everybody's screaming at each other. I'm going, oh, wait a second, what happened? But it's the triggers. Remember, these triggers are a million times stronger than the conscious brain. You actually can't solve it with rational means. But what happens as a parent, you've now programmed your kids for the same patterns that trigger you. So what you've done, you've raised your own triggers. So
So I had one patient a few years ago, big guy, middle-aged, back pain for five years, and just from an intimidating appearance, you know, we were, were talking about chronic pain in the family, et cetera. And he first of all denied it, he was in pain. I thought he came out, he was in pain. Second of all, he didn't really admit to complaining, but it came out pretty quickly that the target of his anger was his son on a daily basis. I go, well, how old's your son? He goes, 10. And I had to admit, I wasn't very nice at that point. I, I sort of teed off on him, which was not my role. I, I didn't apologize the next visit to him. But I mean, you have a 10 year old kid who needs to be nurtured and feel safe. And you have this, this adult, and I'd say, look, you're the adult here. You can't tee off on your 10 year old son. You just can't do it. Fresh. Why would you want to do it? But again, when you're angry and frustrated, you lose awareness. So let me discuss about the impact of family on the pain. They did a study of 105 couples a few years ago. They put a monitor on the spouse and the person in pain. And what would happen is that when the person in pain would either complain or grab their arm or leg, what we we'll call pain behavior, there's a predictably hostile response from the spouse every time, every couple. Then they monitor the patient's pain, and then the pain, of course, went up. And it lasted about three hours. What was fascinating is that the person in pain knew that they complained, that the spouse would have a hostile response. They knew their pain would go up, but they kept complaining. And that's a whole different discussion about actually why that happens. But what happens is that your family gets triggered and it triggers you back and actually increases the pain. I've also found situations where it's actually people that are families of people in pain get used to being I hate the word enablers, but that's what they are. In other words, the entire family is controlled by the person in pain. So the family starts playing that role of a keeper role or a, um, what's the word I want to use it? You know, basically a caregiver role. So that becomes their identity. And I've had this happen multiple times, which shocked me initially, but now I get it. But I've had people actually go to pain-free, go through the process extremely, do extremely well. I had one woman years ago with a lot of pain. It did incredibly well. I mean, some of the worst pain I've ever seen did way better than what I expected. She went to Thanksgiving with her family and they essentially told her, you can't get better. You're in pain. You have bipolar, you have chronic pain, you can't get better. And sure enough, within two to four weeks, she went all the way back into the hole. But the family patterns are familiar in this caregiver role and they get used to it and change in behavioral patterns changes their patterns. You remember, they were with that person in pain for a reason. They didn't want to be with that person in pain, they would have left. And, the, and again, the divorce rate in chronic pain is extremely high for lots of obvious reasons. But the family has a certain pattern to it that becomes dependent, enabling, caregiver role. And so, again, with these family patterns, neurons that fire together, wire together, unless you actually address those family patterns, the person's going to stay in pain. Conversely, if you address the family patterns, you can flip it around and people can come out of pain within weeks as opposed to months. It's been very interesting. Yeah, no, I like a lot of that discussion really rings true with a lot of what we see uh, in clinical practice. I know in our group we have you know, physical therapists, chiropractors, massage therapists, and vice versa, but it's always interesting to see those dynamics inter- you know, play themselves out in front of you in your, in your treatment rooms. But um, I'm curious, you mentioned a lot around, you know, the, the husband, wife, the spousal relationship. And I know you obviously treat more than folks that are just in that kind of familial context. Um, what about like parental stuff? Cause there is like a study I always like to refer to is there's a page study that looked at uh, kiddos after a major thoracic or orthopedic surgery. They looked at what were the biggest predictors of their pain a year out. And it was mom and dad's catastrophization score within 24 to 48 hours post-procedure. I'm just curious, what are the common things you see from a uh, maybe a, a parent-child relationship? I know you mentioned it with a gentleman who's teeing off on his 10-year-old son, um, which obviously was a concerning situation. But I'm curious, are there any other consistent things you see as far as dynamics that exist in that relationship that might uh, negatively impact the experience? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this I went through this with my son and my stepdaughter, and we've been through our share of teenage issues and raising kids and whatever, but this is a tough statement for parents to understand. It took us a year of pretty intensive counseling as a family to get it, but when kids are having troubles, it's always the parents. It's always the parents, every time. Because first of all, the parents are programming those patterns into their kids, 
But what parents don't realize when the kids are acting out like that, they're actually revealing to the, to the world who these parents are because that behavior came from those parents. Now, I know there's some debate in the parent, parenting world about you know, the influence of peers versus the parents. Maybe parents don't have as much of, as effect as we think we do. So we, don't have, we may not have much effect as far as intellectually teaching them things, but we have a massive effect as how we, how we pattern behavior. So the protective parent, and I could talk about parenting for hours, but this over-parenting is, is treating the parents' anxiety, not the kids. And if you're going to protect your kid from failure, you're really telling your kid, I don't trust you. So kids have to be allowed to fail. They have to be allowed to be free. And when it comes to pain against being really odd, I mean, nobody wants to see their kids suffer. But if you are constantly protecting, don't let your feelings get hurt, if they physically get hurt, they get overprotected. And this helicopter parenting is a complete nightmare. And the other thing that's happening now, which is disturbing, is that if you look at a group of people under 30 years old, a lot of them are great. I mean, they're all great kids. I mean, nobody's a bad person. But in the workforce, with our employees, but with my patients, I'm not seeing the resiliency. They get into the workforce and they just buckle really quickly because they're not used to dealing with failure because they've been i use the word coddled all the way along, but the overprotective parent is a huge problem with kids' chronic illnesses. By the way, the, in, the instance of chronic pain, I haven't seen the recent paper, but in 2014, there's a paper out of Indianapolis that showed between, there's over a 10 year span, that between 1984 to 1994, that the instance of chronic pain in adolescence had gone up 800%. I gave a lecture to Seattle High School the out of 1500 students there were 350 on chronic medications wow. and so this mer- so i think right now we have one of three adults in chronic pain and that's about 100 million people that's not disabling chronic pain in other words disabling chronic pain is probably 25 to 30 million people which is about 10% of the population but remember they're patterning they're patterning their kids but yeah, the overprotective parent is a huge, huge problem. So what I'd like to do is to spend the next five minutes going over what we're going to talk about tomorrow, just giving an outline. Yeah. But it's on my website. Go to stage one. There's five steps. Below the fifth step, there's a link that says, click this link to begin your healing journey with your family. And again, this, is, this opens up a door to a whole family section on the website. And what is there, I asked my Let's, let's pretend you're my patient right now and your spouse isn't there. It's just you're by yourself. So the first thing I ask my patients to do is to have every family, every adult in the family, that means over 13 years old, reading the book, going to the website, going through the practices that change the brain. And when we talked about that, you can't solve chronic pain. You actually have to move into wellness. So if you read my book, my book's just a book is by engaging in the tools they actually calm down the nervous system and redirect, they actually people heal. The book gives a context of why you're doing what you're doing, but you have to do it in order to change. So first step is I want each person in the family to engage completely, but by themselves. In other words, and then I ask you the next visit to bring your spouse or partner. So I'll see you back in two weeks. I'm gonna ask you to read the book. I'm gonna ask your partner to read the book. If he, if he or she doesn't wanna do that, we'll explain that on the next visit what's going on. But we now insist that within the first couple of visits that we actually meet the spouse and any adult children if we can. So I want each person in the household to engage in the process completely. As you know, we talked about yesterday, every has anxiety. Anxiety is the pain. So you don't have to be defined as a quote chronic pain patient to get a lot of benefit from the, benefit from the process. So I say, look, just use the word stress. It's the same thing. You feel stressed out and anxious. That is the essence of chronic pain. The second thing I do, I says, when you walk out this door in my office, you will never talk about your pain the rest of your life. I want to put you up a 10-foot concrete wall, metaphorically, between you and your spouse and the rest of your family. So each person does the work on the website and the book, but you're not going to discuss it at all. If you're angry or frustrated, don't walk in the door. Make sure 100% of the time that you walk in the door, at least in a, at least in a neutral to good mood, Otherwise, don't come in the door. There's nothing good that's going to happen when you walk in the front door in a bad mood. So no discussion of your pain. Stay outside till your anger or frustration has passed. 
be aware of what your behavior has on your family. And then the other two I suggest is no complaining, no gossiping or complaining. Because again, your brain's gonna develop wherever you place its attention. So you wanna spend your attention on gossiping or complaining, that's where your brain's gonna develop. I even ask people sometimes, I've done it myself, and I think it's reasonable in this day and age, a lot of people in chronic pain watch the news all the time. And I don't care what your political opinion is, if we, we become very polarized as a country, there's also lots of really bad things happening around the world. So I think the news is very disturbing. But people sit there and they watch the news and get very agitated. Well, guess what? They've, been, they've changed the body's chemistry in a negative way, and the pain goes up. So again, the whole idea is you want to create a calm atmosphere for your household. The third thing I do, which has been fascinating, is that human brains develop through play. Look at every mammal species. The, the kittens play, the cubs play, they wrestle. But that's how the brain develops is through play. So all of us have play pathways in there. Then you get married or you're together for a reason. And so I, I ask each couple to, or their family, if they're divorced or their spouse is gone, to sit down with a friend or family member or their partner and just remember in detail when times are really, really good. When are things great? Why are you together? What's going on? What's that great trip you had? But when you go to that era of your life that was great, why you're together, remember conversations, taste, touch, smell, food, whatever you did, try to get your brain woken up to what, your, what part of your brain knows how to play, because it's there. You don't have to invent those circuits, they're already there. The final thing is I say, look, do this on the car ride home, and then when you walk in the front door of your house, make a resolution that the energy you developed in the car comes into the house and it stays there. What you're doing is you're creating a safe house. Under no circumstances do you argue or fight in the house, period. And I'll have to admit, it's not perfect. My wife's probably a little bit better at this than I am, but we're learning. So we, we find out when we're triggered. Remember, as you all know, when you're angry and frustrated and start to argue, you don't solve anything. And it's like breaking up two boxes in a ring, you just break it, done. So you, you just make a resolution about if you're triggered, the person that's triggered does not want to let go. So it's the other person has to walk out of the room. So let's say we're in the same room and you say something that, that upsets me. We're doing a business deal or something. You really upset me. When you're upset, you can't think clearly because it's just because anger and adrenaline is just on the blessed part of your brain. So the person who's not triggered has to leave the room because the person who's angry does not want to let go. And so of course you have to do this ahead of time because if you're angry and frustrated and the other person walks out of the room, that doesn't settle very well, right? Mm -hmm. But once you understand the rules, it actually is much simpler because you can't talk this stuff out. Again, the unconscious brain is a million times stronger than the conscious brain. So what you do is just simply break it up. So what I'd like to do on our next discussion is going into more details about the family rules around anger, anger, how what breaks couples up is really a neurological trick. There, again, my website has information which will be turned into a book. There's also a book called Parent Effectiveness Training by Dr. Thomas Gordon, which I think is, a, is the most classic book I've ever read. Changed more has more impact in my life than any other one book I've ever read. I've probably read the book at least 25 times. It's called Parent Effectiveness Training by Dr. Thomas Gordon. We can discuss that also. But the metaphor I'd like to leave the listeners with is that for some reason when we're parents, we feel like we have some responsibility to raise our children. You and I both know as adults that our parents had way less influence over us, over us than they thought, right? You sort of learn life in general, trial and error, et cetera. So instead of being sort of a drill sergeant, you gotta teach how to live your life mentality control, really the, the metaphor that's, that hits me is that of a huge valley oak tree where you and your partner are the trunk and you create a atmosphere where all of, it, all of you can be in the shade, protected from the elements, find places to nest and rest, but you want your family to feel safe. And in chronic pain, you don't feel safe because your pain's attacking your own body. Then you tend to project that onto your family. And then again, you get the whole cycle going. So as you create an atmosphere of peace, love, and safety, Everything changes. And what blows us away is that neurons are fired together, wired together. So if you're angry and frustrated, fires up pain pathways. But if you can create an atmosphere with or without your pain that feels safe, it goes the opposite way. So we're having the, we're, I've just seen, we've seen hundreds of people get better, probably over a thousand now. 
But the last two years with these family issues come into play, it's been incredibly powerful. We're really excited about it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, you know, that, that whole family discussion resonates with a lot of the folks that are listening to this, um, just because, again, we see it in our practice and we see how powerfully that situation can modulate a pain experience. Um, I look forward to talking about it more, David. I know uh, we're, got, we're up against some time here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go on for the rest of your day. But thank you so much for uh, spending another good chunk of your time with us, and we look forward to hearing more about uh, the next steps. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you.